When I was a child, my parents went away on an extended trip and I stayed with my grandparents for a few weeks. I have many wonderful, wonderful memories of being in my grandparents' house, but there's one in particular that I want to share with you this morning. I think I was supposed to be in bed, but for some reason, I wasn't. And I remember walking by a room and hearing my grandparents' voices. And I looked in the room and saw that they were on their knees praying. And as I lingered by the doorway, I began to realize as I watched and as I listened that they were praying for me. Not just calling my name out, but really lifting their hearts to the Lord on my behalf. There's something really incredible about being prayed for, really being prayed for. There's a comfort, there's an intimacy, there's a strength that comes from the Lord. When I talk to couples who are planning to get married, I encourage them to begin praying together because you say things in prayer that don't come up in normal conversation. Prayer is a time for you to express your highest hopes and your deepest fears, to really share your heart with that person and with the Lord. There is an intimacy in prayer that is not found anywhere else. And I think about holy moments in hospital rooms and beside those who are dying when prayer brought a powerful closeness as we sought the Lord together, the intimacy of prayer. Now, I know that prayer isn't always that way. Sometimes it feels rather routine or even awkward or artificial. But there are times when it is anything but routine there are times when God's presence seems tangible, personal, and there's an overwhelming awareness of His life-giving love. Now, you have often heard me quote John 16, 33. So I'd like for you to open your Bibles to that place this morning. John 16, 33. If for some reason you don't have a Bible with you, we have lots on the back table there. I would encourage you to get one. Open it to John chapter 6, 16, verse 33. Jesus spoke these words on the night before he was crucified. And he said, y'all know this part, in this world you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. Does that statement match reality? Oh, yes, it does. Our world is a very troubled place. And storms come to everyone. Oh, they have different sizes and different shapes and different timing, but they come to us all. In this world, you will have trouble. Sometimes people turn away from God because He doesn't do what they want Him to do. They pray for healing, and it seems that no healing comes. And they assume that if God really loved them, that they would be spared from all trouble and all difficulty. But that is not what Jesus promises. He says, in this world, you'll have what? Trouble. He tells us, it will be this way. We will have trouble. He does not promise a trouble-free life. But he does promise to be with us. And he does promise that his grace truly is sufficient for every trial. That his grace will be enough for the trouble we are facing. So here the last part of the verse. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, have courage, be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. Now Jesus speaks these words on the night before he is crucified. He's spending time with his disciples. He's teaching them. He's preparing them for what is to come. He knows that they are about to face incredible trouble and that they will not understand why things are happening the way that they are. And it will seem to them that evil has the upper hand and that they have lost. And Jesus is teaching them. Jesus is preparing them. Because he wants them to know a peace that passes understanding. He wants their lives to be filled with joy even when they're facing difficulty. He wants them to have an inner confidence in his love that allows them to face our troubled world. He wants them to be strengthened from within. He wants them to have unflinching courage. He wants them to radiate warm confidence. He wants them to be supported and boistered. He wants them to have a bold inner attitude of hope. And so he says, I have told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. But hopefully you've got your Bible open, and I want you to look at what happens next. Look at the very next verse. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Now it's easy to miss this. The verse comes right after verse 33 and it starts a fresh chapter and somehow in our minds the connection is lost. So don't miss it. Because Jesus wants them to take heart and to have courage and to be of good cheer, because he wants them to be strengthened from within and to have an unflinching courage and to radiate warm confidence and to be supported and boistered and to have a bold inner attitude of hope, because he wants this for them, he prays. He prays. He prays about what he is about to do. He prays specifically for them. And he prays for you and for me. He prays for we belong to him. We belong to God. And after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father... The hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. Now all through John's Gospel, as you read the Gospel of John, Jesus has been talking about the hour. The hour. The hour that is to come. You remember back in chapter 2, his mother asked him to help and he says, My hour has not yet come. But then he transforms water into wine, the first miraculous sign in John's gospel. When he's teaching in the temple courts, the people get so angry that they come and they want to seize him. But John says they couldn't because his, y'all know, hour has not yet come. So now we get to chapter 17 and Jesus proclaims in his prayer very boldly, Now... The hour has come. It's the time for the fulfillment of the promise made way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. It's the moment when everything will change. It's the reason Jesus left the glories of heaven to dwell among us. The hour has come. And Jesus pauses at the doorway to the cross to commune with the Father and to strengthen his disciples through prayer and to claim us as his own. Father, 
the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Jesus will be glorified through the cross. For on the cross, God's holy justice and God's life-changing love will meet together in Jesus perfectly. For Jesus who was sinless, Jesus who was perfect, is willing to lay down his life to pay the price for my sins and for your sins. And God will be glorified through Jesus' resurrection. For Jesus will rise triumphantly from the tomb, overcoming the grave and making it possible for us to have eternal life. Look at what Jesus prays next in verse 2. For you granted him authority over all people. He's talking about himself. God has granted Jesus authority over all people. Jesus is the one that Daniel saw in his vision. You remember what Daniel wrote. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming from the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence and he was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Jesus has been given authority. He has been given glory. He has been given sovereign power over all nations and people of every language. And so he prays, for you have given him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those, to all those you have given him. That he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. As we keep reading this prayer, the verse will become clearer to us. For here we're introduced to a theme that will be repeated throughout this prayer and throughout John's gospel. For even though Jesus has sovereign power over all people, even though he is the king of kings, and one day every knee will bow before him, his prayer here is for his disciples, his followers, learners, people who are growing in their faith, students that God has given to Jesus and that Jesus will claim as his very own. In John chapter 1, John tells us that Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who chose to believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. In John chapter 10, Jesus is talking to his enemies when he says, the works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And my Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And so in this beautiful prayer, Jesus claims as his own those who trust in him, those whom the Father has given him as his very own. And because they belong to Christ, 
He has given them eternal life. And He has revealed the Father to him, to them through, through God's Word and through gifts that He's given to them and through Himself. And they will bring Jesus glory. And they will know God's protection throughout the temptations of the evil one. And they will experience unity with each other that will be a powerful witness to the world. And they'll know a joy that is greater than the circumstances they face. They will be sanctified, set apart by the truth of God's Word. They will reach others who will also be claimed as Jesus' own. And even though they're not of this world, they will be sent into the world and will be Jesus' message to the world. God will dwell in them and they will be with Jesus and His love will live in them. This is what Jesus' prayer on the night before He faces the cross is all about. He prays for those who believe and He prays for those who will believe and He gives them eternal life. Look at verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Many people think that eternal life is something you experience after you die. But Jesus teaches us that it is a present reality that it takes place the moment that you put your trust in Him. He defines eternal life as knowing the only true God and knowing Him in a personal way. Eternal life springs from our relationship with God through Jesus. It's not just later, it's here and now, and it's already begun. Through the cross and resurrection, Jesus will finish what is needed for our redemption. He will complete the work the Father gave Him to do, and He makes it possible for us to have an eternal and abundant life. Look at verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth, by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Here is another powerful theme. For you will discover that everything is related to the incredible relationship that exists between God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They exist in glorious harmony, perfectly united in mission and in purpose, and overflowing with life-giving love. And Jesus will again experience the glory He had before the world began. He is approaching the finish line of His life-saving mission. And you will notice as you keep reading that Jesus' desire is that we experience the same harmony, the same unity that comes through shared mission and purpose and that we are able to live with Him in life-giving love. Look down, if you will, at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. On the night before Jesus died on the cross, he was thinking about you. I pray for those who will believe through their message. That all of them may be one Father just as you are in me and I am in you, 
may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus prays not just for the present disciples, but for all who will become disciples, all who will become students of Jesus, all who will enter into this life-saving, growing relationship with Christ through their message. He wants us to experience this beautiful unity, this life-giving love, and to be part of the glory that we might be where He is. He's about to die on a cruel cross. And he will die on that cross because it is the only way we can be forgiven of our sins. And he will do this so that we can experience this beautiful unity, this life-giving love, so that we can be part of his glory and be where he is. And just as he is about to face the great evil and cruelty of our sin and the sins of all the people of the world, he knows that those who follow him will also experience great trouble. He knows that they'll be in the world, but not of the world, yet sent to the world. Look at verse 14. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus prays for us as we face temptation, as we struggle with sin, as we face persecution, as we face the incredible evil of this world. And his prayer rings down through eternity, helping us right here, right now. Because we belong to him, we are different from this world and we are hated by this world. This world that we live in is not a friend of grace. It is not a friend to what God desires to have happen in our lives. And so Jesus prays that we would be sanctified, set apart, made different through the truth of his word. But because we belong to him, we not only share the trouble of this world, but we will also share the full measure of his joy. For he has shown us the Father, and he has shown us the Father's heart, and that changes everything. It changes how we live in this world. Look at verse 6. I have revealed you, God the Father, 
I have revealed you to those you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. And the glory has come to me and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in this world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name that you gave me. And none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they might have the full measure of my joy within them. That night I heard my grandparents praying for me. It touched a chord in my heart. And I hope that as we have looked a little this morning at the way that Jesus has prayed for you, that perhaps his words could come alive in your heart. That you might know just how much you are loved. That you will know that you have been called to a great mission. That you would experience joy and the power of His presence in your life. And that you would be able to know with confidence that you belong to Him. We have a powerful need to belong. It's why cults and gangs and political movements are so popular. It's why there's so much heartache and loneliness when we feel displaced. We have a powerful need to belong. And that need will only be satisfied when we discover that we belong to Jesus. Let me conclude this morning with the last part of Jesus' prayer, verses 25 and 26. Hear his incredible words of love. Hear his desire that God's love live in us and that he himself may be in us. For he claims us as his own. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make them known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Father, help us. For the prayer that your son Jesus prayed long ago about unity and about love and about overcoming temptation and trouble. It's what we need so desperately. Help us in the holiness of these moments to commit all that we have and all that we are to you. Help us to realize just how much you love us. In the holiness of these moments, move through our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit that 
we would begin to realize the call you have placed on our lives for we belong to you. Help us. Help us to feel your presence and your love in such a powerful and overwhelming way that we can't ignore it, but that we would respond with full commitment. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name.